Welcome everyone. I am Melissa Lockowitzer, and today I'm presenting the ins and outs of stent securement testing. Thank you very much for coming and um, listening to this presentation. So I'll start over with a, a bit of an overview. So I'll give you some background on myself as well as machine solutions, um, the importance of stent securement testing, and then what we did um, to compare three different stent securement type methods to really kind of give you an overview of what stent securement is out there today, as well as where MSI plans to take it in the future. So my background, I have my master's in biomedical engineering. And I've worked in the medical device industry for eight years, um, still in the uh, industry today. Um, manager of the contract testing lab at Machine Solutions, as well as other responsibilities. And I'm a member of the ASTM subcommittee, the FO4.30.06. Um, this is the subcommittee that actually wrote the standard, uh, or the guidance on stent securement. Um, and recently, I led the development team for MSI's current stent securement test system, the SR1000. So a little bit about machine solutions. Um, we are the global leader in um, medical device manufacturing and testing equipment. We have a wide range of products from stent crimping, um, self-expanding stent loading, um, angioplasty balloon pleating and folding, uh, device testing equipment, the SR1000, which I'll talk more about today. So what's so important about stent securement testing? One of the key things is uh, the FDA requires it. Um, but, but more important, I think, to me than that is it's, it's important for patient safety. Um, the purpose of the testing is to verify that you know, the balloon expandable stent that's crimped on that delivery system makes it to the intended treatment site in a very functioning and safe way. Um, so what stent securement looks for, there's a few failure modes, um, three that we're looking at here. One is a straight dislodgement. So if you look at the image on top here, basically this is when the stent moves outside of the proximal and distal marker bands. Those marker bands are what the uh, physicians use to position that stent. And if that stent moves outside of that window, there's going to be an issue with uh, complete uh, deployment of that stent. And if that happens, the doctor's then going to have to take significantly more time to attempt to deploy that stent in a different manner. Uh, another failure mode is stent compression or buckling. And that's um, pictured here. Definitely wouldn't want that pressed up against my vessel wall. Um, it's something that will, um, with those uh, struts being perpendicular to the, the plane of the stent, you're going to end up possibly with perforation into your vessel wall and definitely damage and a longer healing time for that procedure. Then the kind of worst case scenario is a complete dislodgement of the stent. Um, that stent um, fully comes off of your delivery system and embolizes into your system. Now you're potentially looking at open heart surgery to retrieve that stent. Um, and, and definitely a significantly longer recovery time than what you were planning on. So the comparison test. What we did at MSI was we conducted a test to compare three methods of stent securement testing. The SHIM method, the TAPE method, and MSI's SR1000. The purpose was to look at the ease of method setup, ease of operation, as well as output variability. Uh, the SR1000 was launched last year by MSI and is the most automated of the methods. Both the SHIM and TAPE method have been in use for many years within the industry and are currently in use today as well. So some images of the test methods. SHIM and Instron. Uh, the SHIM, sorry. The SHIM method, which utilizes the Instron tensile tester. This is a method that uses thin stainless steel shims. Um, and the Instron um, standard grippers to withdraw the balloon from uh, the stent. The tape method, it's as, as basic as it sounds. You see two pieces of adhesive tape, uh, generally painter's type tape, um, and they're used to secure to the stent. Um, and standard Instron grippers are used to grip your uh, catheter as well as the tape and dislodge the tape and stent uh, from the balloon. Then you have the MSI SR1000. This uses our segmental compression technology, just in a little different way. So we have two segmental compression heads. One acts as the gripper, so you get a nice radial grip on your um, catheter. And the other one acts as the shim. Uh, and then the two heads 
are separated by a motor to dislodge the stent. I'll get into more detail here as well. So some close-up images of the shim method. This kind of um, this fixture is designed around the ASTM guidance document, the F2, yeah, F2394-07. Um, and it is just a guidance document, and the SHIM method is one of the um, methods that is just a possible uh, test method within that. So you have two 5,000 stainless steel shims. These have rounded V-notches, um, and that's what contacts the circumference of the stent's proximal edge. Um, and so you have to have different, um, you have to have different size shims for all of your different size stents and balloon systems. And um, along with the Instron system to support the custom base um, and withdraw. So some of the other challenges uh, with this method set up. So on this image you can see our balloon and stent are below and then our catheter is above. And this is where our grips from the Instron come down. If this sample isn't perfectly straight, if it has any kind of axial angulation to it, you're going to get higher uh, stent securement forces that aren't actually related to the, the stent being secure onto the balloon. Then you have the tape method. Uh, this uses two pieces of adhesive tape, a lot of times just a painter's grade of tape. Um, a lot of uh, effort is put into cutting the tape to the exact length of the stent. So as you can see in this image, um, my proximal edge of the stent ends right at the edge of the tape, distal end, right at the edge of the tape. You can see it here as well. Um, this is the edge of my stent. And then we create two tabs. These two tabs are just folded over a piece of tape, so we're actually grabbing onto the tabs. And we want to prevent any of the tape from adhering to either the proximal or distal edge of the balloon. Um, we also use a clamshell fixture, so we need to basically stick the tape to the stent without actually compressing it um, with our hands or in a non-circular fashion, because we don't want to change how that stent's, stent's been crimped before we do our testing. So we have multiple clamshells that are, um, have radiuses sized to the stent plus the thickness of the tape, so that we can place the tape in the clamshell, the stent on top, tape on top of that, close the clamshell, and try to secure the tape, or yeah, secure the tape just to the stent and not to the balloon. Well, um, if the stent has been probably properly secured onto the balloon, you have parts of that balloon that stick up, and it's very hard to prevent um, the stent or the tape from sticking to that balloon that's right underneath the stent itself. Um, we use a standard Instron tensile tester with two standard grips to dislodge the stent uh, and tape and hold on to the catheter. Um, significant patience was needed with this method. It was the longest. Um, set up per device. It took over six minutes to get everything set up just right um, to be able to get a, as clean a data as we possibly could with this method. Segmental compression, so MSI's SR1000. Um, so with this method, we have, it's a, a fully contained system, has the motors, load cells, um, and the software all incorporated into the system. Uh, the segmental um, compression head that has uh, one millimeter thick segments, that acts as your shims, and it has diameter and force controls. So you can close down that head to a set diameter, as well as knowing exactly how much force you're applying to the balloon just distal to that stent. Uh, the additional set of um, segments is used to grip, and then we have a motor and load cell here that are used to separate those two and measure your withdrawal force as well as the um, withdrawal distance. Another nice feature with the SR1000 is the integrated uh, video system with the data. Sometimes, if you can see on this graph, your securement data is very obvious. This is your initial um, dislodgement point, but sometimes it's not quite as obvious, and having that video linked in time allows you to see exactly when that stent started to move and compare that to where your data, um, where the forces are at on your data. Test samples and preconditioning. So we use 30 stainless steel balloon expandable stents, um, just a standard 3.5 millimeter OD by 24 millimeter length. We crimp them onto pleated and folded balloons. 
Um, using the MSI SC775, this system allows us to crimp to a force while imparting heat and pressure into the balloon. That pressure within the balloon, um, while we're crimping down to force, allows that balloon to kind of expand slightly underneath that stent and get into any of kind of the between struts um, or between segments so that you get a very tight securement of that uh, stent. After we crimped the stent's outer diameters were measured to make sure all 30 samples um, were identical before they were randomized into the three different groups. We had a standard deviation of less than one thousandth of an inch um, for our final ODs. The samples were not tracked through a torturous path, um, as the ASTM standard calls out. They were soaked in a water bath. We opted to not track them for this testing just so that we could maintain as uniform as possible samples. Um, as soon as they get tracked, there may have been slight uh, differences in the stents. And because we were just looking at comparing the three methods and not actually, you know, testing actual securement or wanting to submit this data, we uh, chose to not track uh, the samples. So the test parameters, we tried to keep everything as similar as we could between the three methods. One of those similarities was the pull rate, so 10 inch per minute. This is based on the guidance document. The shim size um, was um, 36 thou to 46 thou. Um, because they're slightly oval um, and non-circular, that was the diameter range for those. Uh, the SR1000 capture diameter was one millimeter with a capture force of one newton, plus or minus 0.2, so we actually can know what force we're applying on that balloon. And the pull distance was set to 10 millimeters for all of the methods. So the results, the exciting part here. So, <laughs> There we go, I got a smile. <laughs> we have 10 stents that were tested with each method. Uh, the graph shows the um, initial uh, dislodgement force in pounds. The blue is the SR1000 data, the red is the shim data, and the green is the tape method. As you can um, really obviously see, the tape method had the largest standard deviation, um, 0.36 pounds. Uh, the shim method was a little tighter on the standard deviation, 0.1. Uh, MSI was below 0.1 at 0.06 pounds. But you also see, along with the, uh, I guess, large difference in standard deviations, is the large difference in your actual stent retention forces. We're looking at an average of 2 pounds for the tape method, 0.5 pounds for the shim, and about 0.25 for the SR1000. So really wanting to look at what causes you know those dramatic differences? I guess statistically difference, uh, statistically significant differences um, in data. So, uh, before we touch on that, um, just wanted to highlight how that initial dislodgement force was pulled from the data. Um, it was actually fairly simple with this group of stents. We just looked at the peak before um, a drop in force was shown. So as you can see here, this was actually a lateral move, so we actually kept going up. Right here was our peak force before we saw a drop in force, and so that would be our initial dislodgement force. There can be higher forces um, farther along in the data, and that may be from the stent going over a distal seal, a marker band, or other feature on the balloon that's meant to secure it that may cause higher forces. So in comparing these three methods, with as close to identical uh, devices as possible, it's a destructive test, so you can't use the same sample over and over again. Um, the difference is definitely statistically significant. Um, the tape method yield the highest forces, but that's most likely due to the tape's adhesion to the balloon beneath the stent, as well as the stent itself. No matter how much we try to gently compress that tape onto that stent, you just can't avoid that, that adhesion there as well as the variation in the tape adhesion to the balloon. There might be a little more balloon sticking out on some stents than on others, and as soon as different amounts of balloon are adhered to the tape, you're gonna have um, a great variation in actually your securement data. Uh, the tape method was also the most time consuming. Um, if you compare the three methods, the tape method took upward of six minutes per sample to set up. The shim method was sitting in about three minutes per sample to set up and the SR1000 was at a minute to a minute and a half to set up for each sample. Uh, 
The non-circular opening of the rounded V-notches on the shim method um, really can be attributed to the slightly higher forces with that method. Um, not knowing exactly how much compression you're getting on that balloon and um, depending on the pleat and fold of that balloon, as well as slight angulations in our setup, definitely led to more variation and higher forces within that method. So some key conclusions, I guess, from this data. The long-standing notion that the minimum retention force of a half to one pound for a secured device may truly be based on the tape method and should not be applied to other methods of stent securement testing. Um, for a long time, when we looked at stent securement data and saw forces below a half a pound, we're like, ooh, that's you know, a, not a very secure device. But I think it just really depends on the method that you're using to secure that, um, to test that securement. Uh, the standard deviation within the tape, as well as those misleading high values, should really put this method into question. And the SR1000 produced very similar results to the, the shim. It had a simpler setup, and you could use the same setup for a wide range of your stent diameters, and the smaller standard deviation highlights its innovative qualities. So some of the features that um, MSI put in uh, to the SR1000 to eliminate some, some of that variation. Uh, we really wanted to eliminate operator setup variable, thus putting in the diameter control as well as the force control. Um, the key with the two sets of segmental head, it keeps those two heads concentric. So when you close down on your grip and you close down on your capture, that sample in there is always linear. You're not gonna have any of the side axial loading to add variability to your data. We have a very short gauge length that we can use on our system. It prevents um, stretch effect of the catheter. We're pulling a polymer. If there's any stretch within that sample, that's going to lead to some variation in your data. Um, and then also, the system just being PC controlled, all of the force and diameter calibrations are simply done within the system, leads to a lot of, um, eliminates a lot of operator variability. The SR1000, it can be kind of a little harder for you guys to visualize. You may not be as familiar with it. Um, the tape and shim are out there. So I did want to show you a video today just to allow you to kind of see. Um, oops, sorry, let me pop back. Um, there we go. Just so you can see how the SR1000 works. We also have this system at our booth. So if you want a live demonstration, please stop by our booth. So this is the the grip side of the segments closing down on your catheter shaft. So we usually set this just to a grip of 20 newtons, just so we have a strong hold. This is the one millimeter uh, shim segments closing down to a set diameter or a set force. Now you can see the two segments. This is your grip and this is your shim. And now you can see the stent initial dislodgement as it pulls in. Within the software, you have full control of your closed diameter, closed speed, your pull speed, um, as well as your grip force and your pull distance. In this study, we did the 10 millimeter length pull. The most interesting information generally does occur within this first one millimeter of the pull, but sometimes it's you know, just beneficial to see what's also happening as it's going over your distal seal or other features of your balloon as it gets withdrawn into your stent. And so it's nice to have both this video and data are then linked in time. So if your operator may have missed when that initial dislodgement happened, they can go back and pull up that video and find that force um, that they need for their um, submittal. So that uh, concludes my presentation today, but if there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them now, or you can stop by our booth, 3135, and I can take questions there as well. Thank you very much for your time and attention today.